Hi everybody, and welcome to this month's specifying practice session. I do want to hand it over to Dave and Lewis to get started with today's talk. Uh, so Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, thank you, Matt. And uh, yeah, this is Dave coming to you from southern New Jersey. Uh, gorgeous day today, and finally uh, get a little bit of sunshine, so this is a nice change for us. Lewis? Oh, it's a pleasant, <clears throat> pleasant day here in Hermitage, a suburb of Nashville. And uh, Dave, we already have a question from really? John Thompson. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, I think we will let you defer since you're the primary uh, presenter here. We'll let you defer to the right time. But he asks a question that I think is on everybody's mind. Well, okay, says, while, you, while you're doing that, we're going to do the obligatory AIA thing since we are giving okay. credit. Yeah. So go ahead. With, within our office, there are differing viewpoints on what steps have to be taken to verify a wall assembly is NFPA 285 compliant. Some fe feel that the uh, ES evaluation service reports for products are all that's needed. Others feel that you have to follow the proprietary products used in the tested assembly and verify the details of the tested assembly that they match the project details. The latter approach causes some issues for some wall claddings like fiber cement siding and MCM panels. Can you elaborate on what depth of exploration is required to prove compliance? <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> it's great to start the presentation with a question. That's wonderful. Uh, we we will get into all of that, and uh, hopefully, we'll, by the time we get to the end, we will have answered uh, your question because we're going to run through some of the code requirements and some of the code history as to how we got to where we are today, and hopefully, that'll help explain uh, what needs to be done to be compliant. Okay. If we get to the end and we still haven't answered your question, ring back in so that we know. Uh, so what I wanted to do is just a real quick uh, overview of what has been code requirement and then again where we are today. So this whole concept of NFPA 285, this exterior wall fire test, was introduced way back in 1988 as part of UBC code. And it was initially... Uh, there to in response to EFS cladding, and considering EFS were really introduced uh, to the U.S. in the 60s, became a lot more prevalent in the 70s because of the energy crisis. You know, it only took 20 years for the code to react. <laughs> so well, especially to be able to install EFS on type one and two, you know, non-combustible construction, basically. Right. So this is not a speedy industry by any stretch, you know, if it takes that kind of uh, time frame for the code to react. Uh, but NFPA 285 actually first came into being in uh, the 2000 IBC edition, which was the first edition of the International Building Code. Uh, and they adopted it. It was uh, the 1998 edition. And NFPA 285 has appeared in every issue since then. So today, um, what we're looking at, or the progression here has really been that uh, NFPA 285 is now being applied to other materials. It was first um, applied to plastic materials, which was introduced in 2009, and MCM panels at that same time. You know, it's been extended uh, to include some other materials. In 2012, for instance, combustible weather barriers uh, became one of the targets, along with uh, the high-pressure laminates and some other uh, materials. And that caused a little bit of an uproar in the industry. And in 2012, uh, IBC, or 2015, sorry, uh, IBC responded to the uproar and actually added some exceptions. And the exceptions were primarily uh, dealing with the WRB, the weather resistive barrier, because of the limited fuel um, contribution that the barrier is making, uh, that there were some uh, exceptions that excluded the WRB from triggering compliance with NFPA 285. 
then, so in, it, in the ever uh, evolving <laughs> field here, 2018, and now it's introduced, um, extended some of those exemptions to the flashings that are associated with WRB because they were not, uh, in the 2015, were not specifically excluded. So where does that leave us today? Uh, 2018, IBC. Uh, I don't know of any jurisdiction enforcing it yet, but it references NFPA 285, 19, or 2017 edition. And there's a bit of a problem here only because that edition doesn't exist. In August, it was sent back to the committee, and now the next um, planned edition for 285 is going to be 2019. So there's the code officials are going to have to deal with this somehow because they managed to publish the 2017 edition and it's not available. So just looking overall at the country and where we are with the code adoption, uh, this is not 100% accurate as of today. So several jurisdictions have adopted 2015 recently. Uh, I said I don't know of any that are adopting 2018 yet, although there, there are some threats here in uh, the Pennsylvania area that they may. Uh, the vast majority, though, are still 2009-2012, and there's some distinction or differences between these two codes, and that's something that you have to be aware of. So that's the majority of all of the states. So what's, what's driving some of this? It's really been about combustible wall assemblies. So NFPA, you know, they're publishing 285. Uh, they actually did a study that was um, conducted in 2013. They're looking at the major uh, fires that have been reported around the world and trying to categorize what's been going on with some of those fires. The kinds of things that they're looking at that they concentrated on really were the combustible wall assemblies. And you can see the list here of most of the ones that they were uh, investigating. And notice they in actually included the weather resistant barriers because uh, when they were first introduced, most of them were asphalt based and did, in, uh, did add a fuel to that exterior wall assembly. David, we have a question from Jay Hindmarsh that relates to that. And he asks, does NFPA 285 <clears throat> apply to any of the interior surfaces of an exterior wall? I've seen this issue, he says, in renovating type 3B masonry buildings and using spray foam and other insulation types inside the building on the ins interior side of the exterior wall uh, the code treats it as an exterior wall assembly and the the effect on interior is really about uh, keeping the fire from spreading back to an interior space above a floor where the floor may be engaged in a fire so as long as the exterior wall assembly remains intact to prevent flame or heat uh, from being from the temperature being elevated in that uh, room above, it should it should comply. I don't know that it would be affected by any interior application. I hope that answers it, Jack. <laughs> okay. So from the NFPA study, here really are some of the major uh, observations that the study uh, came up with. Building fires, the exterior wall fires are really low frequency, but the potential loss is huge. Uh, the loss could be both in property and in lives. Uh, and we've seen some of those uh, recently. The the fires that they observed or that they studied, they found most of them occur in countries with poor regulatory control. And many of these have been reported in the Middle East. 
Uh, we've seen some of the, the biggest fires coming out of the Middle East, and their, their NFPA's interpretation is that it's less controlled in that area of the world. Um, the other one is that the internal fires are spreading to the exterior wall, and this really is the crux of 285 because it um, simulates an internal fire that breaches the exterior wall through an opening and spreads up uh, the exterior wall of the building. And, and then possibly behind the exterior cladding. Exactly. The continuous insulation or an, a flammable weather resistive barrier membrane. Right. And that, that's really this last bullet point, these reentrant corners where the flame can get in behind the cladding. It now creates that void behind the cladding as a chimney and actually accelerates the fire uh, up the exterior wall of the building. So here's one of the spectacular fires, not that we want to say that it's something wonderful to watch, but this is coming out of Dubai. This was one of the ones that the NFPA study uh, cited. Um, the Grenfell tire, uh, Tower was just this last year, and this re-entrant um, chimney effect is exactly what caused this to spread up the uh, exterior wall so quickly because there was nothing to protect the fire from getting into that void space. So what sorts of things are triggering NFPA 285? Lewis, I ought to ask you all this. You should know all this, right? <laughs> it, from, from the quick survey of the codes that we started with at the beginning, it, it depends on which code that you're operating under. So 2003, 6, and 9, it's really foam plastic insulation and MCM. Yes, and, and much of this came about because of the change in the energy code that started requiring continuous insulation in almost all the uh, climate zones of the country except extreme South Florida and, and other southern uh, locales. And, and so one of the less expensive and most efficient uh, forms of continuous insulation is, of course, foam plastic. However, there are, uh, and of course, a lot of people, because of the difficulties in finding tested assemblies with foam plastic, um, I know the firm that I worked for previously has started using a lot of uh, mineral wool uh, continuous insulation to just avoid the question altogether. Right. So remember, 2009 is one of the most enforced codes. So MCM and foam plastic under 2009. But if we look at where we are today with 2012, all of these items can trigger uh, NFPA 285 in 2012 and beyond. So the list has gotten quite a bit longer. We still have MCM, we still have foam plastic, but we've got some other things that are causing uh, some concerns uh, relating to the code. So the combustible weather barrier, high pressure laminates, yes, rooftop mechanical equipment screens. Okay, and for for anybody that um, wants to look at the look up the code citations, these are the um, references uh, in the actual IBC 2012. And I've identified uh, because in 18 there are some other provisions added, so the uh, or the chapter citation changes in 2018. So just for your own reference. Incidentally, we might let folks know that uh, we will make a, a PDF of, of the slides available uh, sometime early next week when the uh, program is also recorded. Right. And the Prezi is public, so you can search for on Prezi.com, search for NFPA 285, you should be able to find it. Uh, 
this is a depiction of the actual NFPA test standard and the test assembly. So it really consists of two rooms, a lower room and an upper room. The lower room is where they set the fire inside the room, plus they set a fire at the head of the opening after the interior room reaches um, a uh, prescribed temperature. And the reason is that it's simulating a flashover condition where the entire room would be engulfed in flame. And at that point, because the uh, really quick increase in pressure, the windows would be blown out and the fire would uh, be going out through the window opening. Which is exactly what happened in the Grenfell fire last summer is that uh, an appliance actually caught fire. It was an electrical fire to start with. The, the fire got going pretty good in that kitchen. It burst through the window and the next thing you know it was racing up the walls. Right. So they set the, the window opening size and part of this with the test assembly is uh, trying to measure the propagation of the flame on the outside of the wall. Uh, so the test assembly is uh, designed to be a little bit larger than that to make sure they can measure it. And again, setting the fire inside the room and then at the window opening. So the acceptance criteria for this test. The shaded, the pink shaded area is the allowable propagation of the flame on the outside of the test wall. If it exceeds that by any, at any point, it's a failure. You know, there's a maximum temperature uh, and the, the thermocouples in this test, there, you see a couple of them labeled here, 14 to 17. I really did not go and count how many there are because it depends upon the actual exterior wall assembly so that if you have foam insulation within that assembly, you actually put thermocouples inside the foam insulation to measure the temperature in the foam as in addition to the surface temperatures. So it's the flame spread 10 feet above the top of the window, five feet from the edge of, or the center line of the window. And the temperature limits then depending upon the assembly because of the introduction of foam and then the uh, temperatures inside the second room or the second floor room. Anything above 500 degrees is a fail. Any flames in that second floor window is a fail. So I don't know if they selected the 500 degrees because of the combustibility of most organics. But if you think about um, what's what's one of the books. Um, uh, about the um, uh, burning paper book, book burnings oh. Fahrenheit 451, <laughs> right? Fahrenheit 451, right. Right. So we get uh, paper burning at uh, 451, igniting at 451 degrees. And a lot of the organics are going to be in that same range. So 500 in that second floor room could ignite anything organic. David, we have a, a comment and a question from Christian Nielsen. Okay. Um, he is quoting, because it's in quotation marks, fire blocking shall be installed within concealed spaces of exterior wall coverings and other exterior architectural elements were permitted to be of combustible construction. Correct. And then he asks the question, in an exterior wall system, where does the wall end and the covering begin and, and really Christian I think the the point of this test is that's kind of a non question the, it has to work together as a system as an, a, an assembly and the assembly itself has to pass the the test and that's why we can't just say oh well we've got a non combustible cladding and and we tested the flame rate of the continuous insulation and we put them together. No, they have to be tested together. Right. And, and some of the things that we've seen is with um, engineering judgments, I'll jump ahead maybe a little bit, where 
if you look at the assembly and some of the bases, because you can't possibly test every imaginable assembly out there. So what the engineers are doing for uh, engineering judgments is they'll look at the, uh, the fuel contribution of, say, alternative materials and measured by a, a calorimeter to determine uh, what that fuel contribution is. And if we have a tested assembly and we want to change out a material, we can look at that changed material compared to the tested assembly does it contribute more fuel or less fuel? If it's less fuel, then it will probably perform equally well or better. And that's really the basis for the engineering judgments. And that kind of gets back to John Thompson's uh, original question about how do we uh, how we find assemblies that have been tested and be able to, to prove that. And uh, I, I know you're going to talk about that some more, but that's those are the kinds of things that we have to deal with because if you think about all the types of cladding that can be installed on a building, all the types of uh, continuous insulation of weather resistive barriers and then of the basic wall construction and you multiply those out you get a very very large number of possibilities yeah so here's the uh, the quotation that uh, Christian was citing from the building code in 2012 uh, was when uh, this this was uh, introduced this fire blocking notion and in 2015 there are no changes to these provisions but nfpa 285 actually provides an exception so they're saying if if the exterior wall is tested to 285 and passes fire blocking is not necessarily required because you've already proven compliance with 285 if you have it in the tested wall assembly you'll need it but if you test it without and it passes you don't need it. Uh, Don Peterson asks, does adding foam plastic to the inside face of an exterior wall count as being part of the exterior wall assembly? And where does the exterior wall end and the interior finishes begin? Well, this goes back again to an entire assembly. So you're going to test the entire proposed assembly. If you're going to put foam on the inside, you'll have to test with the foam on the inside, and you'll still have to have a fire uh, barrier between the interior and the foam. So presumably the foam would be in a stud cavity space or at least behind a gypboard finish in that second floor room. Okay. In... Um, 2012, we ended up with some additional requirements uh, that actually trigger 285, and these are mechanical equipment screens. There's some um, there's some severe limitations to this, and uh, and I, I I will tell you the kinds of buildings that we would normally work on. I can't imagine that we would ever be in a condition that this is actually triggered, but. I, I'm guessing that there are some where it uh, has been a problem, and that's why uh, the code has introduced it. So it's really in all types of construction except type 5, you know, ordinary wood frame. And it really has to do, I think, with the separation between the mechanical equipment screen and the property perimeter or the building perimeter. So this is one where the code has changed between 2009 and 2012. And this is uh, relating to uh, the building height and the types of construction and the fact that now WRB becomes a trigger in 2012. And 2015 gives back those exceptions that we began to talk about at the beginning of the program. So this is one place, depending upon the code, you have to be very careful as to what becomes a trigger. So 2009 is different. 
2012 introduces WRB, 2015 gives you some exceptions, 2018 introduces more exceptions. This is one area where, uh, talking about MCM, and this has been a primary focus on, from NFPA and the combustible cladding. We saw that in the Grenfell Tower uh, fire. This is, this is the area of the code that has had the greatest number of revisions uh, over the progress of introducing 285. So today, um, we're looking at types one, two, three, and four using MCM will trigger compliance with NFPA 285. So you need to understand this very carefully because of the uh, implications that it can have. And there are a lot of uh, conditions that go with this as far as the code criteria. So we need to look at the surface burning characteristics of MCM. They're looking to have it essentially the same as a class A material. So we have to meet that uh, flame spread of 25, smoke develop 450, even though it's an exterior element. What they're using as class A is to try to help uh, control that surface burning and the contribution uh, to a fire by adding fuel to that fire. The One of the concerns is certainly that uh, the plastic cores that were used in MCM when they liquefy, it really turns into a, a, a pretty good accelerant, you know, because it's coming out of the plastics. It's, it's related uh, heavily to gasoline, and we all know what that can do in a fire. Uh, David Paul Gerber, <clears throat> our friend from uh, the frozen north, ask, uh, raises the issue that in these um, summaries here, you, you don't mention the difference between the PE core and the fire resistant core. Good point, Paul. And it was shortly after the Grenfell fire that we had most of the manufacturers essentially eliminating the polyethylene core. I'm not even sure that it's actually available anymore. So the fire resistive core uh, may be all that's available on the market today. And right, there was a difference between the polyethylene and the fire resistive core. They're still both plastics. And, and, the they, both, and they both burn, but the fire resistant core has a, a lot of uh, uh, non-flammable um, fibers in it that slows down the burning rate, re reduces somewhat the, uh, the fuel contributed, and that's why it's called fire retardant, not uh, non-combustible or whatever. And, and the code doesn't make distinction between polyethylene and a fire-resistive core for MCM. It just sets out the performance requirements. And gosh, I guess if you could develop a polyethylene core that can meet all these requirements, uh, you can go ahead and install that on the building. But like I said, I, I believe most of the, most if not all the manufacturers have eliminated the polyethylene. This, and going back to uh, John's initial question, the code requires for MCM that it must be a system test. So this is a complete exterior wall system, right? There are some alternate conditions and these get to be a, an extensive read in the code and I'm not even going to begin to get into them because it has to do with height, area, uh, the individual combustibility of, indivi of the MCM, very complicated. If, that, if you're looking to take that alternative path you probably need to be working with the MCM manufacturer and contractor to make sure that you've uh, absolutely complied with these alternate conditions. If you're not going that alternate path, system testing is required. And uh, you may also want to uh, take a look at the evaluation service reports for the different materials 
to see what their requirements are because in those, for example, some of the manufacturers state that the MCM must be installed with 5 eighths inch type X gypsum wall board on the inside of the exterior wall. Right, and that really comes back to some of the testing requirements. So that's how it was tested. That's what they know passes. And that's what they're going to recommend. And if it and if they're submitting data to the evaluation service, that's what they're going to record in the ES reports. Tommy Smith uh, asks a rather trenchant question, David. He says, uh, to be on the safe side? And since this issue is undergoing change, should designers follow the latest code regardless of what edition, edition is adopted by the uh, local authorities having jurisdiction? I think there's an easy answer to that, Tommy. Yeah, the, I, I actually heard John Straub say this um, last week. You know, the code is the, meeting the code gives you the worst building acceptable legally. <laughs> you know, and if you think about that, he's absolutely right. The code pres prescribes a minimum and there is nothing that prevents anyone from doing better than the code. And whether it's the 2009, 12 or 18 code uh, shouldn't really matter. You can, you can apply, I, you can take concepts from later edition codes but if you're looking at any of the exceptions that later editions are giving you're probably going to have to chat with the AHJ before he's willing to accept them but you can always do more you can always do better than the code um, yeah Vivian Volz brought up that very point that the exceptions that get introduced in the later code editions may not be the best in this situation that's correct so I, I tried to create this flow chart uh, dealing with MCM and you can see it gets pretty complex it's uh, and to follow this all the way through you know you start you start looking at it and saying one of the very first questions is is there a form uh, foam plastic involved if foam plastic is involved then you need to be looking at the fire resistant or the surface characteristics then what building is it applied to you know if it's type one two three or four now we've got to go through nfpa 285 and it and it prescribes some additional uh, requirements for fire uh, performance. We still have the alternative path, again, by height, area, and some ignition properties of the individual materials. The safe bet, just build building our type five buildings, right? We don't have to worry about it because you're already limited by height. And if you put MCM on a type 5 building the height is actually going to be controlled by different factors of the code but you have quite a torturous path to get through here to get to a compliant uh, assembly safest easiest way NFPA tested you know it's compliant and if you build it just like the tested assembly you're somewhat home free okay Thinking back again, 2009 and 12, these are the most often uh, used codes throughout the country. So the Chapter 26 requirements in these two codes are, are identical, right? And so if you're looking at exterior walls, any building, any height, we've got foam plastic in it, we can begin, we can trigger uh, NFPA 285. So that would be your continuous insulation can begin to trigger uh, 285 compliance if we're looking at fire resistance rated exterior walls now we've got some other criteria introduced because you're going to have to test it as fire resistance rated which is not 
285. Fire resistance rated would be from exterior exposure or interior exposure. If you're up against a property line, uh, the, the wall may have to meet a fire resistance rating. You have to do that in addition to NFPA 285. We still have to have the thermal barrier to separate whatever foam we put in the assembly from the building interior. The code says half inch thick gypsum as a minimum thermal barrier. Okay, so what we're, we, I started to um, talk about this as it relates to the engineering judgments. And this is, uh, this potential heat is what the engineers are relying on. So this is, allows them to substitute a material one for another uh, within the test and still uh, meet the intent of 285. As long as they can show that that potential heat contributed by whatever material, the foam or WRB, they're going to use the same kind of analysis uh, to be able to uh, allow additional assembly constructions to meet 285. Still have to look at flame and smoke. You know, we're looking at foam plastics again. We're going to treat it as though it's an interior finish, class A, meet 25 or 450 for flame and, smo uh, and smoke spread. And again, as a way to help limit that uh, combustibility of the uh, foam plastic. Coming back to you again, John, uh, vertical and lateral fire propagation it is an entire assembly test. An entire assembly test. One-story buildings are exempted. NFPA, our IBC 2015 adds some more exemptions. We talked a little bit about those, especially for the WRB. And there are some uh, other concern or considerations where if you can limit that chimney effect behind uh, the exterior cladding by restricting the uh, cavity, the open air space as a cavity, you can get through some of these uh, exemptions. They all require uh, at least a one inch thick masonry or concrete as the cladding, either no air space between the insulation and the, and the cladding or insulation with the flame spread not more than 25. And that's fairly easy to do with uh, the traditional insulated masonry cavity wall. Yes, it is. And with with traditional masonry cladding, and first of all, you have a non-combustible cladding, so you end up with a little bit more latitude anyhow to be able to meet 285. One, one thing that's important in 285 for foam plastic is the labeling. And this, this is just more than the general marking that the code requires for some other products. It usually requires the manufacturer's name, the product name, maybe the date of manufacture. This one has some very specific requirements that the manufacturers must report and must label that insulation with to make sure that it's acceptable for a 285 assembly. So we should just be aware that that labeling requirement is there. And if you're specifying for 285, you may want to request uh, as a submittal that labeling from the manufacturer so that your field CA staff has a way to know that the correct insulation is being installed in that assembly. Okay, deep breath. <laughs> the, um, the ignition of these uh, foam plastics is also uh, one of the concerns. And there are some, again, some exceptions. Uh, 
uh, for exterior facings. And you, you look at the exceptions, uh, you can see that what they're really talking about is uh, non-combustible uh, exterior claddings or facings. So if there's a concrete or masonry, yes, you don't have to be so, you're not going to be concerned about meeting the NFPA 268, which is for combustibility. If there's uh, concrete metal panel stucco, all non-combustible, and 2015 also added fiber cement siding as an exception for those facing materials. Um, Seth Wiley has a question. <clears throat> he says about 10 years ago, he was talking with SWRI testers about developing a small scale NFPA 285 test, which would test a specimen wall area just above the window opening to the top of the specimen wall. And asked, does this testing exist yet? And do we have any idea about any uh, possible code adoption? I'd be very suspect of that, Seth, because the NFPA Teddy uh, test uh, starting it's essentially the same as the one that was invented in 1988 by the Uniform Building Code. Uh, has been around so long and has been f uh, has a lot of confidence in it. the The whole point is that we're not we have to take into consideration: will the the flame start in our one room? break through, go up through the wall, and then engage the room above. Uh, that's the, exactly the problem that happened in the Grenfell Tower, and that's exactly what the uh, the test is meant to try to control. So um, I'd be very, I doubt that that's going to be uh, any kind of meaningful test in, in, in the near future. Yeah, and in, and in preparing for this, um presentation actually uh, what I discovered is there's talk in the industry of actually moving to larger scale fire tests uh, that involve uh, test assemblies as as much as 40 feet high uh, to be uh, more representative of real world conditions that there's some concern that an FPA is uh, too small a scale a test to accurately predict what's going to happen in the field. So we may be faced with even more restrictive measures uh, in the future if the industry is probably being led by NFPA in doing this study and maybe taking the results of the 2013 study and applying it uh, going forward. Because some of the European tests are actually much larger scale than 285. So looking at foam plastic code compliance, uh, this is probably even a little bit more difficult than MCM. You know, the, and I said, we, we start with the very first thing, is this product labeled? If it's not labeled, immediately you're non-compliant. So you might as well not even consider anything else. So, and that's why it, it's probably really important to make sure we're specifying for that label and checking the label if you're uh, CA staff in the field. So we go through the same sort of thing, the fire resistance, the essentially class A uh, requirement. Is there a thermal barrier? If it's, and there has to be the thermal barrier to the building interior. Are we talking about type one, two, or three, or one, two, three, or four? I have two twos. I didn't notice that before. Um, <laughs> pretend the second two is three. Okay. So if we have type one, two, or three, or four, then we really need to be looking at NFPA testing to be able to get through compliance. What, what actually surprised me <laughs> in looking at uh, the codes is if we have NFPA testing 285, we're still not done because if there's foam in that exterior wall and we're trying to build in the U.S. in southern states, Gulf Coast states, where we have heavy termite infestations, 
we still have one last compliance path that that foam cannot be within six inches of grade. And then you may have a compliant assembly. So what have we got as alternatives? Hey, the very first one, use non-combustible cladding. That might keep you out of NFPA compliance altogether. So we're, we're seeing some of our clients moving from, instead of MCM, we're seeing them moving definitely to metal plate and metal panels, some of them to fiber cement. Moving to the high pressure decorative laminates doesn't take you out of the non-combustible. So we have been seeing some folks moving there as well, but that's still a combustible product and still may trigger uh, 285. Move away from non or move to non-combustible insulation. Mineral wool, foam glass. We don't see much foam glass. I, I Coming out of the engineering somewhat background, we used to see foam glass especially for high temperature applications, but it's, it's completely incombustible, it's completely inorganic, which allows you to do things with it that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with other insulation materials. The only difficulty However, is the R value is less. And it's fragile. It so is there's fragile. A, so there are some installation issues that uh, hidden costs. Yes, it is. But if you have the broken pieces, you can use it for sanding. <laughs> they used to sell sanding box made out of the same stuff. Yes, you can. <laughs> I suppose you could do that. Uh, the, the other thing is looking at the air barriers in 2015 and later, see if you can put yourself in a position where you're, you're using an exempted material that would help to keep you out of NFPA 285 compliance. And then the last thing is to look at engineering judgments and to be able to help when none of the tested assemblies are actually matching what you're planning for the project. I, I will say that there are some manufacturers out there that have uh, some pretty good help in selecting assemblies that will meet 285. Uh, they're, they're giving you essentially a Chinese menu where you can pick one from column A, one from column B, and, and it tells you how you can uh, mix and match the materials and still end up with 285 compliance. One of the, th one of the things that absolutely prevents compliance is taking a combustible cladding like MCM combining it with foam plastic for the continuous insulation. That is almost an immediately fail, especially if it's XPS or EPS uh, insulation material. There may be hope uh, to use a polyiso, fire retardant polyiso with MCM. I have seen some assemblies uh, say that that is tested and passed. But you have to be very careful mixing foam insulation with MCM or any other uh, combustible cladding. So what other questions do we have, Lewis? I finished. I finished. I can't believe I finished this a little bit early. So this is great. Yeah, actually. Well, Sheldon Wolf um, states that the exemption for one-story buildings is... Uh, somewhat limited. Uh, he quotes, foam plastics may be used without a thermal barrier in one-story buildings provided that, dot, 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 ellipsis, it is covered with specified metal spacings and the building has automatic sprinkling. This provision is intended to permit use of metal face panels primarily in storage buildings. Yes. Thank you, Sheldon. And yes, I did not copy the entire code. <laughs> I didn't want to bore everybody to tears. But yes, you have, to, you have to be careful to read the exceptions to know exactly what the application is. So 
So, gosh, everybody <laughs> that that wants the credit, it's it'll be HSW. Uh, make sure that you submit your AIA numbers, and uh, we'll get those sent out probably uh, early next week after we get the uh, list from Matt. And next up, as Matt said, we're at um, – Oh, gosh, I didn't change the, the uh, calendar, so I can't even tell you. May something. First Thursday, 3 o'clock, same time, same channel. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, between now and next month, I'll get Lewis to decide what we're presenting. <laughs> so keep those cars and letters coming in, friends and neighbors. Uh, with your suggestions, because, you know, David and I very strongly feel that th this is your program and your discussion hour, and we want to meet your needs rather than what we think we know about. <laughs> so with that, Dave and Lewis, as always, thank you again for the awesome work, and thank you for everybody that attended. You can now disconnect and go about your day.